Okay, I think we get started before we lose some time. So I think everyone is actually keen to uh, get into the presentation. So first of all, welcome everyone. Welcome here from Switzerland. Um, and actually, you know, would be interesting to know where you're all from. Uh, we have seen uh, many people from different uh, locations uh, globally, actually, which is quite quite good. So I mean, feel free to put it in the chat where you're from and turn on your video. Um, so uh, we can actually look at each other. Um, so this is the Project Management AI and Analytics Meetup, the community, as we try to run at least on a monthly basis our, our meetups. Uh, and it's as I said, it's good to see uh, people from all over the world, uh, although we are kind of Initially, at least, we tried to limit it to, to more like the Switzerland uh, or surroundings place, but it's good to see uh, to have many new joiners also from around the world. So there's definitely no limitation. Uh, and it also shows, I think, that how important that topic of artificial intelligence and in project management has become and the growing interest in innovating the project management domain. And yeah, we were kind of overwhelmed with the responses to this meetup session. And uh, so it was kind of giving us a few problems with the Zoom meeting capacity. Uh, so for that reason, and I think um, I sent out an, an, uh, a note earlier uh, via meetup uh, that we have built up a YouTube stream, a live stream. Uh, and so obviously you're already in the in the Zoom meeting here, but if you have some people that you know are waiting outside or have problems to get into the Zoom meeting or anyone who you think uh, could be interested in this presentation at all, please pass along um, that, that URL where you can actually see the YouTube live stream of that meeting here. And um, my colleague will pass that, uh, that already uh, into the chat window. So, um, the topic, the power of artificial intelligence and in project management or for project management, of course, it is around AI for project management. I'm actually quite excited to uh, yeah, look at this or get this get into this presentation from Paul Boudreau. So it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Boudreau. He's from Canada. He has over 35 years of experience in the technology industry. He is a college professor. He runs classes for project management. Uh, he is certainly engaged uh, in the research of applying AI concepts to project management with the goal, obviously, to improve project success rates. And he has written two books uh, about using AI for project management. One is Applying Artificial Intelligence to Project Management, and another one, the second book, How the Project Management Office Can Use Artificial Intelligence to Improve the Bottom Line. I actually have one copy myself. I just can, I can actually recommend. It is an excellent read and gives you a lot of uh, insights uh, about this topic, uh, especially for someone, if someone is uh, rather new to the topic, uh, that is uh, definitely a good starting point. Okay, uh, before I hand actually over to uh, Paul for his presentation, uh, just a little bit about the logistics. Uh, so uh, we have a presentation from Paul running approximately for 60 minutes. Uh, that will be followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, but please feel free to put any of your questions into the chat uh, at any time. Um, so uh, Paul probably will pick up a few questions here and then during the presentations, but uh, we obviously try or definitely will try uh, at the end, the 30 minutes Q&A to pick up the remaining questions. And actually this is also valid for the YouTube live stream. You will see if you look at this, uh, there's also a Q&A box or a chat box. Uh, we will also monitor this box. So we get all the questions uh, over to Paul and get them hopefully all answered in the time that we have allocated. Uh, and as part of the presentation, um, uh, Paul will ask you uh, a few questions also via Mentimeter. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Mentimeter uh, for uh, surveys. Uh, uh, if you're not, I mean, it's, uh, the URL is menti.com. 
Um, and we put that also into the chat, um, I think. Um, and there's a special code that you need to type in uh, in order to get to the right questions. The code is 83251825. We put that into the chat. Uh, and then um, would like to ask you to actually navigate there to this uh, URL, to Mentimeter. And there will several questions, so please stay on, uh, even if you uh, answered already questions there, uh, there will be additional ones, so please stay on on this URL. Okay, uh, I don't want to uh, give or take too much time away from Paul, um, so with no further ado, I would like to hand over to Paul. Again, welcome, Paul. Um, happy to have you here, and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Marcus for putting this, uh, this meetup together. Uh, Marcus and his team are really you know, driving these changes and improvements to project management that we so desperately need uh, in this profession. I have a couple of administrative issues I want to talk about first. Um, I've been having problems with Zoom. So my Zoom client doesn't work. It's been escalated into Zoom support. Uh, so I'm using the Zoom browser and I'm just not completely familiar with it yet. So I'll probably apologize a few times, but I'm from Canada, we're polite, so we always tend to apologize for things. Uh, second thing is, yes, I, want to, uh, I want to make this a bit more of a workshop, so I will be pausing through the uh, presentation and stop and ask, uh, I'll take a couple of questions from you. And with that in mind, I want to introduce uh, Alex uh, Goodwin. Uh, so just uh, kind of wave your hand or something, Alex. Uh, she's one of my research associates, and she will be looking at the questions that show up in chat. Um, also, if you have a question at some point that doesn't get answered, uh, feel free to leave it in the chat, and um, uh, Alex will capture it, and at some point we'll get back to you by email or whatever. All right. Um, is that about it? Yeah, I think so. I hope so. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> One of the most dramatic changes in the history of project management has started. We're moving away from a process-centric methodology to a data-driven method. And this data-driven method is the foundation for using artificial intelligence to manage projects. It's happening now, and it's undeniable. Not only will this change the way that we manage projects, it will change the knowledge that project managers need to be successful. Listen, project management training and certification will become meaningless unless you know how to manage data and interpret AI results. Okay, there's two huge challenges to this change. The first one is skepticism. People just don't believe it or they don't wanna believe it. I can't do anything to help you out there. The second one is knowledge and today, I plan to provide you with more knowledge about AI and how we can use AI to increase project success rates. And I also wanna talk about this workshop. I do see some familiar faces here. Thanks for joining. Uh, some of the people I've presented to or talked to in Europe are on this call. Um, I'm going to start off very basically and talk about some basic concepts, but then because I have a full hour, I'm going to move along and it may become more technically challenging for you. Okay, please just uh, uh, hang in there and, uh, you know, you know, grab a grab a beer, glass of Merlot, whatever it is, just enjoy it. All right, let me share if I can get my slides up. And I'm going to share, there it is right there. And there we go. All right, so one of the things in the browser is once I have my slides up, you won't be able to see me, but I'm still here. And there we go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. All right. So here's my agenda for today. Basically talk a little bit about an introduction. What is AI? So that we're all on the same page. I'm going to talk about some AI tools that I'm developing as part of my research. Now, listen, I'm not a vendor. I don't sell things. I do research. And I, I use these tools for education, and research, and academic purposes. I want to talk about the importance of data because, of course, data is important. <clears throat> and I have a few takeaways we can talk about when we wrap up. 
<clears throat> this is the most important slide you're going to see in the whole deck of slides that I have, all right? And it's the way that AI is going to disrupt project management. I talked about it. We are moving away from this process-based adherence. Follow the process and you'll be successful. No, that doesn't work. 30 to 40% project success if we're lucky. And we're moving to a data-driven model. And that data-driven model is going to use AI to make better decisions, to make sure that projects stay on track. And what is AI? All right, so AI at its core consists of software code. Uh, I use a programming language called Python. You can use Java, C++, any number of languages. Uh, the software code uses iterations or loops. For anyone who's written any software code, it's the idea that you can use loops to go round and round and create uh, a model. <clears throat> the AI logic, the logic for AI is based on calculus, calculus equations. I remember, you know, when I took calculus, I thought, when am I ever going to use this in my career? And guess what? It's here. I know you all love calculus, right? Um, the next thing is that AI learns. This learning process, it learns by creating data models from data that is correlated. It correlates data to create a model, and then we use that model as a reference. And I'll explain that in a minute. There are three basic uh, learning methods supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. There are more and there are combinations, but these are the ones that we really should be aware of. The first one is supervised learning. Let me explain what that means. Think of a, a picture of a cat and you label that picture cat. Now think of a picture of a dog. You label that picture a dog. So now maybe you have 10,000 images of a cat. 10,000 images of a dog. And you feed that into the software program and it creates reference models of what a cat looks like and what a dog looks like. This is labeled data, supervised learning. Then what you do is you take an image that's not labeled and you put it into the computer and say, well, do you think this is a cat or a dog? And it was in the year 2005 that a computer program based on AI was more accurate than a human at giving the correct answer. Supervised learning based on labeled data sets. Unsupervised learning. Well, unsupervised learning, the data is not labeled. Uh, but if you have enough information, you can know what it is. Uh, uh, here's an example. I'm thinking of an object. It has branches, it has leaves, it has roots in the ground, it has a trunk. What is it? Well, it's a tree. But I didn't tell you it was a tree. I didn't label that as a tree. You figured it out. And, and we call these features in machine learning language. If you have enough features, you can decide and determine what the object is. You can classify it. The last one is reinforcement learning. And the example I use on this, although I don't want people to try it out right now because I'm doing my, my talk, is you have a smartphone. And on your smartphone, you go to type in a word. And I'll give you an example. The word I use is stone meadow. Uh, my business name is stone meadow. So I go type in the word stone meadow. It's not really a word. So I go type S-T-O-N-E and it comes back. The phone comes back says, oh, you must mean stone mason. You must mean something else. And I say, no, no, and I force it in. The second time I go to type it in, the same thing happens. They say, oh, you must mean something else. I go, no, I mean stone meadow. But interestingly enough, the third time I do that, it accepts it and says, oh yeah, you mean stone meadow. That's reinforcement learning, learning through um, uh, repetition, making mistakes or learning what the correct is. It's like riding a bicycle, self-correcting, all right? So <clears throat> now we know a bit about what AI is. I have to tell you, uh, I, you know, when I present to the United States, everybody's jumping up and down yelling, Arnold, Arnold. So I hope it's not too unfamiliar in Europe. There's something out there that I call the Hollywood myth. And the Hollywood myth says, I don't know, uh, one day robots are going to become alive and, and decide to go make themselves a sandwich. Or wait a minute, even better. One day robots are going to become alive and decide they want to kill people and take over the world. That's not AI. That's called entertainment. 
okay? And a lot of people have these creative imaginations and all sorts of ideas. That's not AI, that's the Hollywood myth. AI is based on calculus equations in math. If you think there's some issues with AI, uh, I can recommend a book uh, called Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom. Even the most advanced academics and researchers understand that AI cannot become alive. It's not physically possible. There are other issues with artificial intelligence, but I won't get into that right now. There are two components uh, of AI that I think are the most important for project management. One is machine learning and the other is natural language processing. And I have examples of both of them for you today. First of all, machine learning is based on historical data, uh, uses a software algorithm, which I'm going to demo in a minute. And natural language processing treats words as data. And I'll have an example for you there as well. Very, very valuable tools. So what I'm going to do is, if I can switch this, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about machine learning. I'm going to talk about supervised learning. And I'm going to stop sharing this. Okay, go back here and try and share. It's just a bit more awkward with my, um, oops, nope, that didn't do it. Share, Chrome tab. There we go. Uh, can you see this? Alex, say yes if you can see it. Yep, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I did is I created this uh, uh, prediction tool. And what I was trying to do is predict the success of a project before it started. I created a three layer neural network. I have here um, uh, three nodes on the left hand side, but I don't have, um, I don't use three nodes. I have uh, 87 factors that I created. And in the middle, we see three layers that are to represent the neurons in the human brain. This is not a human brain. It's software. It's software code. And the right hand side, uh, I'm going to have a prediction. And what I did is I went around and I had my research students, um, they did a survey of project managers and said, what do you think are the most important factors for project success? And so they collected all these 87 factors. And then what they did is they went around and they collected some historical projects. So these are projects that are completed. And they looked at these projects to see whether they had these factors or not and whether they were successful or not. So let's say use this tool. This is a cloud-based tool. I use uh, Excel spreadsheets, by the way, to, um, to load my data because it's easier for me to do this. So I'm going to load some data in my tool here. So you can see the first uh, uh, column is a list of projects. And the first row contain the 87 factors for these projects. Now, these are completed projects. And what, what my research students did is they went in and said, oh, does it have this factor or not? In machine learning language, these are called features. So does it have this feature? Yes or no. Now, once we have all the data in there, we add an 88th column, and that's the success value. Was this project successful or not? How do you define success, you might ask me? Well, it's, you, it can be user defined. You can define it however you want. Uh, we defined it based on deliver the project scope, no more than 5% over budget or 5% late to schedule. Okay. So now that we have this data, our data labeled data sets, this is supervised learning labeled data sets. We're going to train the model and the code is going to run through loops and find correlations in the data. It's going to come back and give me a validation. Well, hundred percent. Usually it comes back and says something like 90%. Nine times out of 10, this is accurate within so many percentage points. So I have training data and I have test data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this model. Paul's model one, I call it a demo. And I will save that model. So now I have this model, okay, that correlates what makes success across this range of projects. Now I'm going to do a prediction. And I happen to have two projects in an Excel spreadsheet here. Now, these are projects that have not started yet, okay? They have not started. And what I want to do, and you can see, so we went through all of the features, and we said, which of the, based on the documentation for the project, which of the features did each of these projects have? And then there's only 87 columns. There's no 88th. 
There's no success value because that's what we want to predict. Will these projects be successful before the projects begin based on the reference model? So we're gonna perform a prediction. So we get a couple of results here. The first one says 99% probability of success. So what do you do with that? What do you do? Well, let me suggest this. If your organization has a project screening and selection process, then maybe you should add this as one of your criteria. For example, you say, all right, um, uh, financial value to the organization, ROI, payback period, whatever metric you use. You may have another criteria, um, strategic alignment to my organization. How well does this meet the organization's objectives? And now you add a third criteria, which says, what's the probability of success for this project? Because I don't know about you, but I would rather implement a project that looks like it's going to be successful than one that looks like it's not gonna be successful, all right? Now, what do you do with project B? Project B has a probability factor of 39%. What do you do? You have to implement project B because of legal or regulatory reasons. Well, what I do is I bring my project team together and I say, project team, um, you know, project B, the strategy that we're using to implement this project doesn't look very good. Let's rethink the strategy. Let's rethink our delivery process. Reflect that in updated documents and try and get a higher probability of success. And I use my words very carefully here, okay? I said strategy, because I don't want this to become a documentation exercise, a paper exercise where somebody says, oh, I'm missing this, let's go put a one there. No, that doesn't work. It has to be the strategy for how you're deciding to implement this project. Now, these two projects, um, this is before the project begins. Uh, what about as the project is being executed? Well, we have a template for that. We have a template for that. And I want you to think about it this way. You're in a video game. You're in a project manager video game. And there's a long hallway in front of you. You take a step and you go to put your hand on a doorknob, uh, a door to the right. Before you open that door, run the predictor tool. It says you now have a 34% probability of success. Don't go there. Don't make that decision. Step back. Take three steps down the corridor. Put your hand on a door to the left. Run the predictor tool. It says you now have a 95% probability of success. What's happening here? What's happening? We now have an AI-based tool that is helping and supporting a project manager make good decisions as the project is being executed to keep that project on track and make it successful right to the end. All right, now I'm going to do one more thing here just uh, before we get into uh, some surveys. I'm gonna do another training because I've we have all sorts of templates in here. One of the ones I wanna use for people because they said, oh, we can't use this for Agile, can we? Well, we've identified a number of factors for Agile, and there's a number of sprints down here. You see a number of sprints. And we have a success value. Was this sprint successful? However you define that sprint. And once again, we create a model. Am I gonna save this model? Sure, I'll save it as a sprint model, demo, save it. And now we can go into prediction, and we have, uh, hopefully I have some sprint uh, projects here. Okay, before these, before these sprints begin, I have sprint A, B, and C. Let's perform a prediction. There we go. Sprint A, 97%, sprint B, 29%, sprint C, 79%. There are some other ways that you can do calculations on these projects and look at the probability. There's other things you can do with the probability as well as looking at your strategy. I won't get into that right now, but it's one of the things that we work on and part of our research, okay? So that is the predictor tool. Let me stop sharing this for a minute. Go back. Uh, and I'm going to go back to my slides. All right, so that was the demo around the three layer neural network using supervised learning based on 87 factors collected for historical projects. The model predicts success or failure and um, we have a number of templates. 
I showed you uh, the overall project prediction in Agile. We have a risk template that has, I think, close to 400 features in it. Uh, stakeholder management, absolutely fascinating template that has been worked on. Um, and we have a number of other templates. All of these templates um, are flexible. What that means is you can add or subtract any number of features that you want. Uh, instead of having 87 factors, you could have 200. Uh, instead of having a feature that says, you know, is your scope document, uh, you know, written accurately, or whatever, you could change it and make it something else. All right. So I'm going to pause here at this point, and I'm going to see if people have some questions uh, in the chat. So I tell you what, uh, Marcus, while we're uh, putting questions into chat. Why don't I let you take control, and then you can start off with your first uh, first Mentimeter question. Yeah, I will do that. Okay, uh, so the first question was for the survey, what type of projects do you most often work on? So there were already several responses. Yeah, that's good. Hybrid, you know what? I see hybrid all the time. That's really is the most common now. Um, I have to say that, well, I'm gonna talk about Agile a bit, a, a bit later on as well, okay? Um, because we're more into technology, there's a lot more technology type of projects. We're seeing this move towards Agile and at least the hybrid because Agile has its downfalls. Okay, and Alex, do you have any, uh, any interesting questions from the chat? I haven't seen any come up in the chat just yet, but uh, I can start you off with one of my own. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm just wondering how much historical data is needed to be able to use AI tools? Uh, yeah, great question, great question. And um, uh, Peter Gross, if you're on the call, I'm not making fun of you. Some people say, <laughs> uh, Peter, it's only because uh, uh, we're friends, right? And you purchased one of my books. Some people say you need vast amounts of data to make, uh, to make uh, uh, supervised learning work, especially. And historical data is mainly for supervised learning, okay? Mainly for, and you do need a large amount of data. However, um, First of all, we're not in the medical field here. This isn't about you know, making decisions on whether a child under two has pneumonia or not. I mean, for that you need, or for an MRI brain scan. For an MRI brain scan, AI is working in those fields now, but you do need to have a lot of data to be accurate there. There is a professor um, here in Canada who's doing research on this in the business world. And he believes in the business world in some situations, as few as 50, uh, project data sets are sufficient to develop a correlation. Now, that may mean you need a, a large number of features uh, above the data sets. So, so it, it depends. We de the true answer is we're not sure, but we know that project information with project management and with business, we don't need the vast amounts of data sets that are required in other fields. The other thing I'm going to talk about as we move on here is with unsupervised learning. So when we get into unsupervised learning, we're classifying things. And as we move into that field, you'll realize that we don't need vast amounts of data sets. As I move into um, um, genetic algorithms and talk about those, uh, they, they don't need vast amounts of, of data. So when we talk about this vast amount of historical data, we're talking about supervised learning with labeled data sets, okay? Uh, Marcus, why don't we move on to the second question as well, Mentimeter question. We'll do that now and then we'll... Sure. We've got a couple more questions in the chat for you, Paul, if you'd like to take them. Sure. Awesome. So the model you shared is interesting. Are there any market available solutions that apply this model in a user-friendly way? <laughs> yeah, good. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot to mention the predictor to a model. Uh, the predictor to a model, by the way, I offer it for free. Whoa, did I just say free? So here's what happens. I use it for educational and training purposes. Uh, it's a cloud-based tool. You can access it using a browser. What you do is send me an email or connect with Alex and Alex sets you up with an authentication code 
and she will send you a little uh, training video and maybe some sample data sets and you are free to use it as long as you share your any insights you gain back with me okay so that's the first part that i forgot to mention if anybody wants access to the predictor tool it's free just ask me as long as it doesn't exceed the account limit of whatever i'm paying for right now um the other thing is do vendors have this type of thing uh that's for conversations with people like uh like peter peter gross is on the call um there are other vendors who um use this type of supervised learning but i don't have a pretty interface on it okay uh, i don't i don't show it in a you know in a what do you, in a dashboard and i don't you know make those predictions in that format but there are vendors who do this now and they have much better interfaces uh, i think marcus's group does some consulting in this area as well so i don't want to leave them out of the out of the loop here just uh, connect with marcus there's many vendors i can also tell you there's way more vendors in europe than there are in north america somehow uh well i won't say i don't want to say i gotta be careful canada uh, yes, has has a few AI vendors specifically for project management. Uh, the U.S. is just lagging behind. I think all the skeptics they just we push them south of the border. They're all down there. Uh, Europe, Australia, especially the U.K. A lot of vendors moving into this AI field for project management. Okay, our next Met, uh, Menti, have you ever worked on a project where you had a sense project failed from the start? Well, what is that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to see the percentage. So. Um, uh, it's like, so the question first is, have you ever worked on a project where you had a sense that it would fail from the start? We yes. have uh, 20 responses so far, 17 say yes, three say no. So wouldn't it be nice to know? I mean, you can say, yeah, I know this is going to fail. But now if you use something like the predictor tool, you actually almost have proof. You can go back to your customer or sponsor and say, listen, look, Here's the evidence. It doesn't look so good that our strategy is going to be successful. And then somebody, I showed this to someone and they said, well, yeah, but what happens if it, if it's a 70% probability of failure and I actually deliver it, then I'll look really good. <laughs> yes. Um, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez is one of the PMI, he used to be on the board of directors for PMI. He showed a survey that said 70% of project managers uh, had worked on a, on a project where they figured it was going to fail from the start. So this reflects that exact, that exact um, uh, result as well. And I thank you for doing that because this helps me validate some of the work and the research I'm doing. All right, let's move on. I am going to uh, go back to the slides if that's okay. Um, if you can stop sharing, Marcus, all right? Yeah. Thank you. Here we go. So we were there and I'm going to go to, okay, I'm gonna talk a bit about unsupervised learning now. These are uh, uh, unlabeled data sets. And the research I'm working on here is something called clustering, it's classification. So what we have is we have a template with the features, and we'll call this task complexity. So how complex are the tasks that I have on my project? Maybe I have a thousand tasks, 1500 tasks. And I look across the features and I'm classifying them on complexity, whatever the features are. And in this particular case, let's say the green ones are high complexity. The purple ones are medium, the blue ones are low complexity. How does that help a project manager? Wouldn't you like to know the percentage of high complexity tasks on your project before you begin? This has some meaning. So for me, what I would do is say, okay, do I have the technical competence now? to be able to manage that level of complexity. Maybe I have a project, maybe I'm working on three projects and I have a project that has 90% low to medium task complexity. My technical skills are all, are all very well aligned to that project. It, it's to help provide meaning and interpretation into your projects, okay? Unsupervised learning, we're gonna talk a bit about, uh, more about that again later. We're going to go a bit more into some more technical, complicated uh, aspects. So there is a machine learning field called genetic algorithms. And I'll talk about that. This is software code that simulates Darwin's theory of evolution. Not about religion, not about faith, okay? It's about a theory and taking that theory and putting it into a software, software algorithm. What happens is we have parents. Parents have children. 
the children of the parent take on characteristics of those parents. They don't take them on 50-50. Obviously, you haven't met my son. He's nothing like me at all. So what happens is there's not this 50-50. It can be 80% of the genes, 20% of the genes, any randomized factor. Plus, interestingly enough, there's something called a mutation. And a mutation is something that gets in there that is from neither parent. It just happens to come in. It uses a machine learning algorithm based on loops, uh, mainly unsupervised and reinforcement learning. And the best outcome is known. All right. So if uh, Darwin's theory said it's the survival of those uh, species that are best able to adapt to the environment, they're able to adapt to change. And so he said, we know the result. The result is people who can adapt to the change or species that adapt to the change. That's why they're still here. And with projects, the best outcome is known. We know the project scope. We know the project end date. We know the project budget. Those are known. So what we're trying to do now is use this to find out how to get there. How do we get there? And why bother? Why bother with genetic algorithms? Let me get back to calculus without trying to scare you. There's this thing called gradient descent, and that term is the best correlation. And if you have a neural network, you're going down this graph and you see it, I hope you can see this, the bottom of the curve here. In a neural network, it says, this is the best correlation for these two variables. Or in the case of many, many features, this is the best correlation across this entire data set. But what genetic algorithms do, interestingly enough, is they keep going. And this becomes what is called a local minima. Okay, it's the best correlation for one set of algorithms, but a genetic algorithm keeps on going, looking, looking for even a better correlation. Think about you're going down this hill. As soon as you start going up again, things stop. Not with the genetic algorithm. Genetic algorithm, it keeps on going. So how do we use this? How do we use this? Well, we can find the best allocation mix for a sprint. And I have an example, hopefully I can show you in a minute. Uh, feature engineering. One of the things people always ask me is they say, oh, Paul, your predictor tool, you said 39% uh, probability of success. Can you tell me which factors contributed most to the success? And in a normal environment, uh, the answer is no, we can't do that with a neural network. However, with a genetic algorithm, we can. There's a way to do it. It will pull out and tell you which characteristics uh, have the most contribution towards the probability prediction. Uh, community of risks, swarms, I'm going to talk about that, and self-driving project, I'm going to talk about that because that's where my research is heading. So first thing to note about uh, genetic algorithms, the data requirements are different, okay? Less historical data is required. There's a large amount of possible solutions, and in order to get there, it goes through them. And I'll have an example for you. Uh, Uses specific item criteria, constraints. We use the word constraints in project management. So we start with this seed data. We, we, we put this uh, uh, synthetic or fake data uh, initially, and then we evolve, and the genetic algorithm evolves new data sets based on that. And of course, we use feedback loops uh, because it's a software program to make it work. Swarms, I wanna talk about swarms for a minute. Have you ever uh, walked past a field and there were birds? There's a group of birds in the field. And all of a sudden they get startled and they all fly up and they, they kind of move off in one direction, then they move off in another direction, but they never hit each other. And they always seem to find the right direction to, to become safe and they all move away in that direction. And what we do with genetic algorithms is we have software code that replicates this characteristic in nature. We can use something in a machine learning language called k-nearest neighbor or a neural network to prevent this crashing and find the common exit. What I'm using this for, what I'm using this swarm technology for is two things. First thing is if you can define this swarm, maybe this swarm is a bunch of risks. And now is there something missing in this swarm or is there something in this swarm that shouldn't be there? So there's a risk that you don't need to worry about because it doesn't belong with the rest of the swarm. The other thing, so that's the first one, commonality. 
We're looking for commonality. The second thing is the collective ability <clears throat> of a swarm. And in, in um, genetic algorithms, there's something called a particle swarm optimization. And what this is, think of a project manager on a project. And the project manager is sitting there trying to solve a problem all by himself, all by herself. Now think if you had 200 project managers on that project trying to solve the problem. You would have a lot more creativity, a lot more ideas, a lot more probability of getting that problem solved faster and with a better solution. And that is coming into my next demo. So what I'm going to show you is a bit of my software code, and I'll apologize again because I'm Canadian. It doesn't have a pretty interface. But this is known as particle swarm optimization. I'm going to put a swarm inside this little container. And there are four exits. If you see the four blue holes down here, and what we want to find is the exit that's closest to zero, zero. In other words, the one that's closest to the bottom. Some of these exit holes are a bit higher off. Of course, if you see the red, that's way high off. You can't get out there. Okay. So let's just uh, stop sharing this for a minute. Uh, go back to my main one, share Chrome tab. And unfortunately, I can't show you this live because my Zoom is not working, but I will show it to you in this format. So what I have here is, there we go. This is my development environment, by the way. I better pause this for a minute. Uh, my development environment in Python. So I have some uh, software code written here, and the results are going to come up on the right-hand side. What I've done is I said I want to run 500 generations. Uh, of this code to see how what the best solution is to get out of that container. All right, and this runs on my desktop computer, by the way. I'm going to press the Run button, and you can see that's how fast it is on my desktop computer. So the best solution location here is uh, 3.7 by 3.2. We can go back and look at that. But the best fit, and I want to show you this here. So look, 480. 480 is the best particle. See, 00102 is that 480. And yet, there it is there, 00102. That's the best solution. And yet, it continues on looking for better solutions. In fact, if I was to rewind the code up to a higher number, you'd see that it had found almost a better solution. But it keeps on going. All right, stop sharing it. That's particle swarm optimization. We're trying to find not just a solution. We're trying to find the best solution to a project problem. OK? So when we look at it here, if you looked at the coordinates, the coordinates would say it was this blue hole over here. So the opportunity we have here is to make decisions faster when faced with ambiguity. OK, it's more uh, uh, more knowledge, more ability, more project managers on the same problem trying to find a way out. OK, that's swarms. So the next one, uh, this is my current research, uh, navigating through a maze. And we think of the maze as the project environment. And the walls in this environment are obstacles that have to be navigated. They could be risk. They could be stakeholder management. They could be quality. They could be uh, resources, technical issues. All of these walls represent obstacles. And I'm creating a project agent, a self-driving project agent, who will learn how to go through the maze. And using a genetic algorithm, what happens is they learn where all the obstacles are, so that by the time you go through this a couple of times, then it will know how to manage the project much better than the first time it did it. There are some organizations who have this uh, software. I won't say this software, but have this concept available. What they're doing is they attach into your existing tools, like a JIRA, MS Project, uh, things like that, and they build a knowledge repository. And in that knowledge repository is essentially the navigation process of how you manage to get through each project. And it's building up this knowledge repository and, and helping you as a project manager learn how to make good solutions. All right, that's my research right now. It gets a bit more tricky because what I'm doing now is making the walls move. 
and uh, talking about some politics and stuff as well. All right, I'm going to pause here for a minute and see if we have any questions before I go on to my last uh, section, which is natural language processing. So let me get back to, uh, to Alex, see if we have any questions in the chat. Awesome, we do. Um, got a good one here. How would data um, be linked to MS Project or Primavera to get an update in regards to project success? So this is in reference to your predictor tool. Can you connect it to uh, Project or Primavera? Um, I can. Uh, there are tools. So um, I'll answer. I'll answer one of the questions that people may have is, um, you know, vendors like MS Project. Do you think that vendors are going to start adding AI to their tools? And the answer is, listen, MS Project has got so many lines of software code. I think they just gave up, right? You can't add anything else to, to MS Project. Look at the menu system. It's, it's unbelievable. You can't even navigate it anymore. Um, so what they're doing is something called Power BI. You're familiar with Power BI? So Microsoft has started Power BI. And if you get your data out of these tools, and use Power BI to be able to do some correlation and data mining in them. Can you get the data from, uh, I don't have a direct connection into the predictor tool, no, but there are ways to get your data uh, out into different formats from Microsoft Project. Okay, good question. Good answer. Um, another one here, uh, how is the success probability calculated and verified within um, the predictor tool? Does training the model involve comparing predicted success with the amount of projects that succeeded? Or is the probability not an actual probability, but the activation of the artificial neuron interpreted as, an, as a probability? Uh, all the above, if I understand that question correctly. So uh, the way it works is it says, I want you to think back of a dog or a cat. So you have all this amount of data in the predictor tool based on what makes a project successful. And think of it as an image. So it's not an image of a dog, but it's an image of what makes a project successful. And now you bring another image and say, OK, how well does this image represent the correlations that you have in the data? How close is it to your success image? And it comes out with the probability that way. The predictor tool is correlating data that we can't think of in our minds. And when they do this with medical imaging, for example, they, they have like, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 data sets. And because they're using pixels, they can have hundreds of millions of pixels. All that data is correlated into making a prediction. We tone that down a little bit in project management. We don't need that vast amount of data, but it's the same concept. You're correlating the data into an image. And now you're saying, this new project that I have, how closely is it? That's how you do the prediction. Um, so you train the model and then you do the validation on it. So the validation does two things. The first uh, part of the validation says you've got all your metrics in properly. You've got all your data in properly. The second part says, uh, let me give you some test data that I already know the answer for. And based on the answers, how valid is that? And we saw, I think mine said 100%, but it could be 90%. So the training data and the test data is separate. All right, you train the model, you test it to make sure it's accurate, and then you make a prediction. Now it's really important to keep updating, updating the model with data. Unlike an academic model where people come out, oh, do this for stakeholder management, and then it disappeared. You, you just, they never update it, right? And it's a mess after six months or a year. With a predictor tool, you must always update the data, constantly update the data. Okay. And as you constantly update the data, your model will be giving constantly better results. All right. Okay. Can we move on? Move on. And we have some more Q&A at the end. All right. It's going okay. Let's talk about natural language processing. Where am I here? Natural language pro, uh, screen is, oh, I didn't show the uh, knapsack. Oh, I showed that with Agile. That's okay. All right. <clears throat> Natural language processing. There's three, three um, aspects to this, document analysis, sentiment analysis, and virtual assistant. I don't do much in the first two, uh, but I, I'm working with the virtual assistant part. So first one with document analysis, 
Uh, there are tools out there that allow you to analyze your scope for completeness or errors. Now, if you're in the Agile environment and you have user stories, I will give a, a, a plug to my friend Colin Hammond in the UK, who has a tool called Scope Master. And what Scope Master does is it takes in your user story and it, it does a number of things. It does cost estimating, sizing, um, but it looks for uh, errors and omissions based on the language that you have in there, verbs, things like verbs. And what, what it does is, for example, um, it will say, oh, user acceptance testing. Uh, there's something missing here. You create this function, but you never test it. Or, you know, you have a user acceptance test, but you don't actually create it. And we know from software development projects that finding an error at user acceptance testing is the worst place you can find. You might have to redesign the entire code. So anybody who's in an agile environment, you need to look up scopemaster.com. Uh, I don't get any commission for recommending this. I'm just trying to help you out. Uh, very, very valuable tool. There's one in Canada as well uh, that's used on waterfall projects, more based towards waterfall projects that analyzes scope documents based on templates and things that are uh, scope statements that are in common from your organization. Second thing is sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis evaluates communication for positive and negative sentiment. This gets into a bit of ethical issues, but I'll just explain it to you. Uh, Microsoft Teams has a module that does this. So you have a project kickoff meeting. Uh, your project team goes back and they start working. They're sending each other emails, they're texting, they're using a workflow document. And the sentiment analysis tool looks at that language and analyzes it and can give you back a, a metric or a trend metric to say, you know, the team looks frustrated. This team didn't understand what you said in the meeting. And now you can modify your communication plan. All right. Sentiment analysis talks about how people are feeling, positive, negative. Uh, it's, I don't want to get into it too much because it's not my field, but uh, people can even do this with facial recognition. As humans, listen, as humans, we already can, we know this, right? Can I say this? My wife's not here. You, you go home from work and look at your spouse and she has got a mean she or he, a real bad look on their face. Okay, tread carefully, my friend, right? Be careful, be soft, be gentle. We know when people are angry. We know when people are frustrated. We can read that language. Guess what? AI is much better than you are at reading it. All right, the last one I want to talk about here is the virtual assistant, one of the areas I'm working in. Uh, I identified three levels for the virtual assistant. Uh, you're all familiar with virtual assistant, Alexa, uh, Google Assistant, Cortana, Siri. Um, first is basic uh, retrieval of information. Second one is understanding project management concepts. And the third one is I'm linking it to machine learning. I'm going to do a demo here, so I want to... Uh, Stop this for a minute, get back in here because I want to show my face. There we go. I use Alexa. I use Alexa at home. <clears throat> Let me see if I get a less. You know, never demonstrate technology live because it's always a danger, right? See how she's feeling today. Not Alex, Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, is there any training in the scope document? Yes, there is training. Five people are identified for one week each of training. Would you like more detail? Oh, wow. Wow. So there are a couple of organizations that do this, one in the US, one in Europe that I'm aware of. They will take, not for project management specifically, but they will take uh, policies and procedures or large legal contracts, things like that, and load it onto a, a database for you. And they allow their employees to do queries on it. Let's take this to the next level. I'm going to push my luck here with Alexa. Alexa, there are three tasks this week. Can I move them to next week? The tasks scheduled for this week are not on the critical path. However, one of the tasks has an identified risk based on the risk register. Should I contact the risk owner and ask her to contact you? Okay, wow. Come on. Wow. Round of, uh, this is just a demo. What I'm trying to do is, is show you the capability that we have with natural language processing. And I want to go back to my slides. Uh, I am working on this with my research team. 
It's one of the things that uh, my research associate, uh, Alex, is going to get involved in very shortly. Uh, let me just go back and share back to this one here. There we go. Uh, because what we're doing now is we're going to be able to say something like, how do I reduce my budget by 5% without changing the project end date? And as a project manager, we go through a process. We go through a logical sequence to do this. Maybe it's, you know, reducing overtime, uh, checking contingency, whatever it is we can do, right? So we're going, to, we're going to try and code that into the software and then add some machine learning intelligence to it to say what is the best solution. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about that this gives us. First of all, as long as you have your smartphone, it's something called ubiquitous project management. That's what I call it. Ubiquitous project management to me means you can manage your project anywhere from anywhere at any time, as long as you have an app that's based on your project on your smartphone. But there's a second thing in here as well, and I don't know if you caught that, is when Alexa said uh, there's a risk. There are tools out there now that do predictive analytics. And I'll use the example of Jira. Oh, did I say that? Sorry. So what happens is there's tools out there now, and I won't mention any names, but they do things like, okay, you've got, you've got George on this task. And, you know, George isn't doing so well. So the tool comes back and says, oh, listen, if you keep, if you keep George on this task, your schedule is going to be late by two weeks. You should put Marcus on this task instead. Marcus is a real go-getter. He'll get this stuff done. Isn't AI wonderful? As a project manager, isn't AI wonderful? Not so fast. Not so fast. What about risk? What about quality? Eh, the tool doesn't care. Who cares about that? It's very narrow focused. And as project managers, aren't we the ones that are supposed to have the total perspective of the project? And so maybe we put George on that task because George gives us the best quality or George reduces the risk. And what does this tool say? Ah, yeah, change the person up. I don't care about the other stuff. So we have to be very, very careful when we're implementing these project management tools that we don't trade off something that we don't recognize, we don't, we don't see because they're not going to tell us. Okay? Uh, the value of AI, and I want to talk about the importance of data. I'm running a bit of, uh, out of time here, Marcus. I'm going to take another 10 minutes. Um, project documents, project status, project conditions, structured data is essential. Anybody who's done a data migration program before, uh, project before, they, you know, support me on this. Uh, one data field means two things. Two data fields means the same thing. You got format issues, year, month, day, day, month, year. You have data fields that are blank. You have data fields that have typos in them. So structured data is essential to make this work. All right, and one thing I'd like you to do, uh, if you want to take over for a minute, Marcus, and you can ask the last uh, Mentimeter oh, question. Yeah, let me <laughs> share it. Okay, so the question is, and if you all could navigate there again, please. How long does your organization store historical project data? One year or less, one to five years, or more than five years? Okay, as people are thinking this is updating. So I'm familiar with government organizations because I, I, I might have, <laughs> I can't reveal my client list. I might have worked with a government organization in Canada. They have project data from since the day they started, like 20, 30 years. The, the problem is it not necessarily the right kind of data. And when I say that is think about going through a project. And think about all the decisions you make on a daily basis or weekly basis. Do you capture those? Sure, you have a risk plan. Sure, you have a budget. Sure, you have a schedule. You capture all that data. But I have a problem or an issues report. And I go through my issues report. 
and I say, okay, uh, you know, we got to fix this scope item. Uh, what are we going to do first? And you start making decisions and you're taking actions. Do you capture all the data for the action you took and the results that you got out of those actions? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. So we got to capture not only um, a certain amount of data, but it has to be the right data. It has to be appropriate data to make these tools work. Okay, so you want to stop sharing, Marcus? I'm going to go back. Uh, hopefully, people are enjoying this. I think I got about five to ten minutes more, if that's okay. Yeah, that should be fine. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to talk about agile. All right. Um, and this is just one of my pet peeves. All right. And my pet peeve is these people who come on and say, "Oh, the reason we need agile is you can't predict the future." Well. What do you mean we can't predict the future? Of course we can. Our whole human existence is based on being able to predict things. Listen, if it's raining outside, go outside and stand in the rain. What's going to happen? You're going to get wet. You know that. Now, listen, go into your kitchen. Uh, don't do this. It's just an example. Go into your kitchen. If you were to go in your kitchen, go to your stove or your oven and you turn on the element, element or burner, I think you call it element in Europe, turn on the element to high, whether you got a gas stove or whatever, turn that element on high, let it sit for 10 minutes on high. Then take your hand and put your hand right on top of that burner and hold it down. You're not gonna do that because you can predict what's gonna happen. You're going to burn your hand. You're probably gonna end up in the hospital. You, you're gonna need medical attention. You won't be able to use that hand for quite a long time and yet, Unlike the example of out in the rain where you've, you've probably had that before, you were now able to predict something that's never ever, well, I hope it's never happened to you, that's never happened to you. You can predict it. AI vastly improves the reliability of our predictions. So this myth of agile that says you cannot predict the future is completely false. They're trying to make it look like we need agile for some reason that's not necessarily true. AI is going to give us better predictions. Second thing with Agile, we can't use Agile because we don't capture enough data. And I had my other research associate, Courtney, go out and look into this. She uh, talked to Agile specialists, project managers uh, around the world, actually. And she came back to me and, and said, listen, Paul, lack of documentation doesn't mean there's a lack of data. She said, it's there, it's there in the emails, it's there in their text messages, it's there in their workflow. And sometimes it's even there in their heads. The data is there, it's just not documented as highly as it is in waterfall projects. Plus with Agile, there's shorter project cycles, there's all these sprints. So it's not like you're waiting for five years to capture some results. You capture sprint data on a regular basis. So the fact is that Agile you can use AI with Agile projects. Um, briefly, I'll go through this with customer requirements. You want to do some sentiment analysis, look at historical data to find out you know, what uh, scope and functionality the customer really is attached to. User stories, I talked about that. You can use natural language processing for estimation. Sprint, I did a demo for prediction tools. Scrum, uh, you can do sentiment analysis on your team to find out how effective your communication is. Uh, Agile train a uh, genetic algorithm for sprint contents. Do I have that one? I have that one here. And scaled Agile, discipline Agile. Uh, let me, I'll do another demo here. Uh, sorry, so let me get to this. I'm navigating. If you hear dogs barking in the background, that means it's an Amazon delivery has just arrived. All right, so this is another one of my, uh, I'm going back into my environment. What I have here is I have a, um, it's called a knapsack problem. What can you fit in a container? And in this case, I've got a scope item that takes nine hours of resources and the value in terms of a dollar, I've signed 150. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this. And what the genetic algorithm does is it goes through and I've said, okay, my maximum capacity is 400 resource hours. That's the most I can use up, 400, yes, zoom in. And so what's the best mix? What's the best mix? How do I get there? And it shows you, it says, okay, here's what you need to add. Then it says item 16, 17, 18, 19, 21. This is the best combination. 
it adds up to 396 resource hours, and here's your total value. This is the highest value you can get. Now, I know you might say, well, Paul, it's pretty easy. I could use an Excel spreadsheet to do that calculation. And, and you're right. But with a genetic algorithm, uh, because I haven't had time to do this, you can add more constraints. You can add a risk constraint. You can add a resource constraint. You can add a, uh, a quality constraint. You can add all sorts of constraints. You can have five or six constraints all in, in this, and you can have scope items. You can have a, a, what do you call it? A backlog. You can have a backlog of 200 items. And the genetic algorithm, this machine learning tool, will say, here's the best mix of these products to achieve what you're trying to do within the constraints. All right? Again, um, because I'm Canadian, I'll apologize. It does not have a pretty interface, but, um, it's something for me to work on, right? In my spare time. I'm almost done. Where are we here? Almost done. Last couple of slides. All right. Uh, so the value of AI technology uh, increases project success rates. Okay. Reduce project costs by really focusing on what you need to get done. Improves customer loyalty, expand project capability. The whole point of AI is to proactively resolve issues minimize variances and make better decisions. How do you get started? You might ask me, how do you get started? Well, evaluate your project data. Okay. How much do you have? Is it structured data? Is it appropriate data? Uh, and I always tell my clients perform data analytics first. So we've had a couple of people come to me and say, listen, can you look at my data? And I look at it and say, listen, um, do a Pareto chart or, uh, one of the, my clients from Australia, uh, she went out and bought MathWorks because you want to do data mining and predictive analytics before you get into AI. All right. Uh, key takeaways, AI based tools are here. Data is critical. There's a learning curve. There is a learning curve to this. There's interpretation. There's understanding what balanced data means. There's understanding all sorts of things in this. Uh, so knowledge, your knowledge about it is very, very important. Okay. Uh, listen guys, as project managers, I believe, I believe that we, uh, I'm just gonna put this down for a minute because I, I want you to see me when I say this. There we go, there we go. All right, here we are. As project managers, I believe that we need to embrace this technology and use it to achieve the highest levels of success that we can get. Because listen, this profession of project managers, we truly deserve it. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Marcus. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. Anyone has questions, anything in the chat? Or Marcus, if you want to do the final Q&A. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Paul. It was a very insightful presentation. Uh, I will just pick up um, a few questions from the chat, which I believe haven't been addressed yet. Sure. Uh, so one is uh, from Lucas. Tang. Um, so, I mean, you have shown the, the factors that play a role, right, uh, in, in the model, etc. So he's asking, aren't most factors subjective? And could it not be that managers trying to get their project admitted will hack the input features? <laughs> yeah, that's why I said it's not a paper exercise. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I believe that most uh, metrics are objective. I think everything is objective. Even quality metrics are objective. Um, and, and if, I mean, you can ask me things like, oh, can you put low, medium and high? Yes, of course you can. Look, if somebody wants to sabotage your project before it starts, then they can do that. I'm just here to show you how AI can actually make things successful. But what you can do, here's my recommendation is run some sentiment analysis and run some stakeholder management analysis on your management team. And you'll see if they're being deceptive or not. Now, they might not like it, <laughs> but it is. Um, listen, ROI, return on investment, is that objective? I believe it is. If they give you false numbers, then what you have to do is compare that to, to other numbers. And an AI tool can tell you whether it's an accurate business case or not. Uh, the other thing is the metrics in your schedule. I mean, task completion, task starting, task ending, how much you spend on a task. You know, how many change orders you have, uh, how difficult the change orders are to implement, uh, what the budget is for each change order, what your risks are, how many risks occurred, how many risks didn't occur. 
in your project. Those are all fairly objective. Okay. Um, uh, so, I mean, maybe, I mean, also uh, whoever asked that question, so in this case, Lucas, I mean, uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a follow-up question uh, on this, uh, otherwise we can proceed with other questions. Um, so, I mean, uh, that's maybe related. I saw, also saw another question in the chat. Um, do we know which features have the highest impact on success? So I think it's uh, similar also in terms of the subjective view, right? So, I mean, who determines actually which factors are of higher importance than, than, than others? Well, you know what? As you go through this process, you should be able to figure that out, okay? So you collect the data, uh, you run your, your model, your model gives you prediction of success. You you run the project, it's not successful. Well, you didn't have the right features, right? Your test data will show the validation is not good enough. And so you need to collect a different set of features. If you have projects that are successful, you can run a genetic algorithm and it can tell you the characteristics of that project that made it successful. Uh, what are the features that make a project successful? It is going to be based, we don't know right now, uh, whether it's based on project type, whether it's based on the industry, whether it's based on the organization. And right now, my belief, it's an organization based. So you can have a construction project, the way your organization implements it and the way your organization uses data will determine that process for making the project successful. You could have another construction company beside you with a different uh, process and their projects are not successful. So what are the features that make it successful? It could be organization specific. Maybe it's project specific. Maybe the project has too much risk in it. And so the level or volume of risk, unsolvable risk, maybe that's what makes it uh, unsuccessful. Okay. Um... Uh, oh, Mark, can I can I stop you before? I just want to mention sure. about something else. So, yeah. <clears throat> so how do we know what features make it successful? It's a learning process, and we have to go through this. Right. But I want to be very clear on this one. Okay, is there's expectations because it's software. There's expectations that AI is going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. All it has to be is better than what you're doing now. Wouldn't you accept? a 10% better success rate than what you have now, AI is not going to be 100%. It will gradually grow, gradually grow into a role <clears throat> where, where more and more success is attributed to that factor. There's something in financial markets. I'm, I'm reading a book now about people who are using AI in the stock market to be able to predict um, how to build uh, financial wealth using AI algorithms, machine learning algorithms. And they're pulling it. So what features make it, make a stock successful? Who knows? They're pulling in everything and trying everything they can. Okay. But what they do is they call it the alpha. The term is the alpha. And what the alpha is the difference between a human person trying to manage this portfolio of funds and an AI. And the AI gains a measure higher than what a human can do. That's what we're looking for in project management with AI, especially at the beginning. Okay. Um, here also another question. Uh, I think they kind of all go in a similar direction, but um, wouldn't pure probability-based decision-making result in very few moonshots being pushed forward? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the questions. <laughs> the question that one. So I repeat, so wouldn't pure probability-based decision-making result in very few moonshots being pushed forward? So projects with high chance of failure, but if they succeed, the rewards are huge. Um, well, really, you know what? I mean, I think we're here because what it gets back to the person who asked about the stakeholders, right? Sometimes certain stakeholders like Elon Musk have expectations that are beyond what's capable. But now we have a tool that can say, well, look, you know you're, you, you want to get this done by this time frame. Um, the prediction is not looking very good. You can go ahead and run the project. There's nothing saying you, you're going to stop the project. 39% probability of success. Okay, go ahead. That's why I only say we're aiming for a 95% probability of success because there's always going to be projects 
the stakeholder says, I don't care, do it anyway. You can say, we don't have enough data. We don't, you know, we're not, we don't have the right strategy. Stakeholder says, I don't care. We're going to do it anyway. I'm not like Nicholas. <laughs> I'm not like Nicholas who says 99% probability of success. I say 95. Nicholas, I told you I'd get you on that. <laughs> So what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, and I've heard this from organizations I've worked with. I work with a multinational organization out of uh, Germany, of all places. And they say one of our biggest issues is training sponsors and training customers and what project management means. And, and I can see that as a, as, a, as a possible problem. But we have stakeholder management templates. How do you manage stakeholders successfully? Okay. And again, it's about data. We're moving to a data-driven organization. It's not about, you know, okay, uh, you know, let's get our requirements traceability matrix. Uh, let's do our risk response plan. How do you know those are going to make your project successful? How do you know? What is your biggest pain point in your project? Get AI and get data to figure that out. Okay. Right. Um, um, I, I mean, I have a question for my... Uh, Myself, uh, I mean, how do you see the human factor actually in this wall uh, picture, right? Because obviously uh, AI does recommendations, et cetera. And I think you mentioned before, like if some uh, team member is not performing right, we should reallocate uh, certain tasks to a different person. I mean, how do you see this, uh, how, how far that can go? Because obviously there's a people factor, the human factor in there, which is really hard to measure, right? Or to, All right. to like, get metrics on this. Yeah, no, it's not how I can measure anything. Um, listen, here's the deal. I want to be very, very clear on this, okay? Uh, AI is not going to replace project managers because companies want to save money. AI is going to replace project managers because they can't achieve the project success rate that they can with AI. All right. So you're thinking a $200 million project. Oh, let's use AI. We don't need a project manager. Let's save ourselves, uh, you know, $80,000 or 80,000 euros. No, no, no. They're not going to get rid of project managers because they're trying to save money. They're going to get rid of project managers because project managers mess up. Okay. So we need to collaborate with AI. We need to use this as another tool. Think of it like a screwdriver. You know a screwdriver, you know, like a flathead screwdriver, you fasten something. How many people have used a screwdriver to open a can of paint? Yeah, you pry open the lid. We have to be able to be creative to try and understand different ways to apply, apply AI. And listen, another myth I'm going to tell you, and I've heard people and maybe even somebody in this call, I won't mention his name. You know, AI will never replace the soft skills of a project manager. Are you kidding me? If project managers had great soft skills, why do I see people inundated? Oh, here's a communication course. Here's a leadership course. Here's a... Project managers do not have these soft skills. They weren't born with them. They have to take training to get them. Have you ever worked for a manager that you thought was terrible? Because I've worked for many managers that were absolutely terrible. So now you're saying, oh, yes, project managers have soft skills. No, they don't. They're terrible, okay? Some project managers have great soft skills, but listen, AI is better at you than recognizing issues with people. If you don't believe me, go to a website called effectiva.com or receptivity.com. And they have AI programs that's gone beyond facial recognition into being able to interpret people's feelings. And as I said, you know, if somebody looks frustrated, you go, oh, okay, yeah, you're looking a bit down today. You know, how can I help you? AI is much better than you. And if you still don't believe me, uh, uh, pick up my, my latest book called Silent Resistance, but I don't want to plug it, you know, so. Um, yeah, and that was going to be one of the questions I was going to talk about, uh, uh, Marcus, if you didn't bring it up. Uh, will AI replace project managers? The most important thing is the, the project managers who learn to work with AI will become more valuable in their organization. They're going to gain that knowledge of interpretation. What does 85% mean? You know, do I need to, do I need to go back and get more data? Uh, do I need to look at balanced data? <clears throat> I haven't even talked about balanced data and success values yet. How do I interpret? What does an F score mean? What does an F score mean when I'm interpreting this statistical result? So those kinds of project managers, 
that bring up their knowledge level of how to manage data, how to interpret statistics and use AI tools. Those are the project managers that are going to be extremely value, valuable and they're not going to lose their jobs. Um, I, I have another question, I, but I mean, if anyone obviously in the audience has additional questions and uh, please again, right, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, but I have a question in your view, uh, how do you see that to actually get the appetite from organizations uh, to jump on this AI initiative, right, for project management? Because obviously it's quite revolutionary, especially when you say like uh, project managers will be replaced. So how do you actually, say that. in your view, how, how would you bring that to bring that yeah. forward? Yeah, I said they had to collaborate. I didn't say they're going to be replaced. I didn't say that. That's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, so listen, uh, AI is a great buzzword now. People don't understand what it means. Okay. Uh, the multinational corporation that I worked with out of Germany, I talked to the CIO. He had a meeting of all his project management offices from around the world. And I said to him, you know, I mean, I can give you some help with a business case for implementing AI tools. He said, no, no, I don't need help. My CEO came to me and said, do it, right? So some organizations are going to be just doing it and other organizations are not going to do it. And we're going to see a shift. There's going to be this, this um, uh, polarization in industries. The industries that start using AI tools and move towards this data-based pro project management, they're going to be more successful. Their costs are going to be lower. They're going to be a more reliable supplier. They're going to be able to deliver on time. And they're going to start winning more bids. The people who ignore AI in project management are going to be less successful. Their projects are going to cost more. Their resources are going to be more frustrated. They're going to make bad decisions because they don't make decisions based on data. So it may take a while to see this, but over time, it's going to be obvious. Organizations that don't use this are not going to survive. Now, I don't mean two years, five years, but I see it happening already in the industry. Now, I wanna talk about vendors for a minute as well. There are vendors out there and you have to deal with vendors who are AI at their core. So something like a Shark Tower out of the UK, uh, I talked about Scopemaster. Uh, there's a company in Canada called Melly.ai. Uh, these are vendors that provide um, AI-based machine learning tools. There's, an, uh, there's uh, Octant, there's two in Australia. Um, and there's also organizations like, uh, like Marcus is working in right now, right? Consulting and building products to help you uh, uh, work on this. You need to connect with some of these people. They'll all give you a free demo. Go ahead and talk to, to um, uh, you know, to, to Edward uh, at melly.ai or talk to, um, oh, who's my friend at, um, at uh, Octant, uh, David, David at Octant in Australia. They'll give you a free demo, okay? But how do we get this moving? We get this moving by awareness. The first step is always awareness. And then from awareness, we start to gain knowledge. And all of you are here today, which is fantastic because hopefully you've gained a little bit more knowledge and you'll see this starting to creep into project management. Listen, PMI, forget it. I'm sorry. Can I say something? Is anybody from PMI on here? So I went to PMI and I asked them, I said, would you, would you um, support my research into a virtual assistant where I prove I proved to people that using a virtual assistant that PMBOK, PMI has the best processes. They rejected me. Are you kidding me? I'm about to help your organization stay relevant. And the truth is that the PMI processes are becoming outdated every single day as every day passes. And you look at it, uh, people who've got agile processes, Look at that big mess of agile processes they've got. They've got experts at PMI who'll help you develop your agile processes. I can't even keep track of it. It's like somebody threw a bunch of food at the wall or splattered paint, right? Oh, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to. No, you don't. You have to do whatever the data tells you to do. 
to be successful. That's what you need to do. You don't have to do everything in Agile. You don't have to do everything that PMI tells you to do. The academics at PMI are going to say, yes, do everything. That's the way it works. No. Look at the data and let the data provide your direction to how you're going to make your projects successful. Whew. Am I passionate? Yes, I know. But PMI rejected me. I couldn't believe it. They even, listen, uh, part of the slides that I showed you today, uh, PMI had asked me to do a presentation, like a webinar thing for them with, I don't know, they get 3,000 people. And they looked at my slides and said, nah, no, we can't show those slides. <laughs> was there anything in my slides that you thought was like particularly bad towards PMI? So, the, so here's a, a couple of questions. If you actually contacted uh, IPMA, for example, or um, what about yes, that's Stu, I think that's APM, right? Uh, so in the UK, yeah. if you contacted yeah. them as well and what's the reception there is. Uh, great. As I told you, people in Europe are much more uh, receptive. So uh, APM, I've done at least two presentations for APM. Uh, very, very good feedback. Uh, you know, they've asked me back. IPM, yes, I believe I've done a presentation for them as well. So it's just uh, PMI. I've done a couple of presentations for PMI. Local chapters. I do local chapter presentations. I do one for Chicago, one for uh, a couple in Canada. <clears throat> I don't mean to be negative of PMI. If anybody's certified, like I'm PMP certified. So I think it's a fantastic organization. I just think their strategy is starting to go off in the wrong direction. PMI should be telling people, here's how to make projects successful. That should be their number one goal. Let's figure out how to make projects successful. Their number one goal is training and certification. Let's get as many people trained and certified as possible. That's different than making projects successful. All right. Okay. Um, I mean, we are practically on the hour. Uh, Any last questions? I think, can I just, sorry, throw something in here? Sure. Alex, did you put my contact information into uh, the chat? For sure. I'll put it in there now. Yeah. So if people want to connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free. Very happy to connect with you. Uh, if uh, you want to send me an email, you can do that. Uh, you should be able to connect with me on LinkedIn. Or uh, Alex can put my, uh, my email address in there. Connect with either one of us. If you have any questions after this, um, after this presentation, again, feel free to connect with me and ask questions. I'm happy to reply to emails to anyone. I just have this passion to get this project success rate uh, much higher than what it is right now. Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, good final words because I think we are all in this uh, initiative or this direction that we want to improve success rates. I suppose that's why we are also all interested in this topic and to drive that forward. So thanks again, Paul, for this presentation. I think it was very very insightful, uh, and I believe um, uh, anyone on the call will agree with me. Uh, and yeah, I think the contact details uh, will be pasted there. And and just as a reminder, this presentation has been recorded. So uh, it will be available on YouTube. It will be, the link will be posted. Uh, so you can review this again if you like. So uh, thanks again, Paul. And maybe everyone can go for a moment unmute and give a round of applause for Paul uh, for this good presentation. I think it was quite insightful and uh, at least I have learned a little, little bit more today. Thank you very much. Marcus, thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, and everyone have a good evening. Or good have day. a good evening. Everybody. Thank Stay you very safe. much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye.